Good afternoon. Welcome you all for the first CME activity of uh, CSRRL in this year. We have two important presentations today. First presentation <coughs> is uh, uh, by Dr. Uppara Disanay, consultant rheumatologist in teaching hospital Kurunayagala. She will be discussing a lady with prolonged fever. Over to you, Uppala. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I must thank Dr. Palika Disanayaka, the President of College of uh, Specialist in Rheumatology and Rehabilitation, for inviting me to give the inaugural presentation in his office. Today, I'm going to discuss a, a patient, a interesting patient with you all in next half panel. My presentation is a lady with prolonged fever. Right. So when somebody comes to us with prolonged fever, there are several uh, differential diagnoses which uh, come to our mind. So what could it actually be? Could it be an infection? Could it be a autoimmune connective tissue disease? Can it be a systemic vasculitis, which is commonly present with, which can commonly present with constitutional symptoms and organ damage? Can it be a malignancy? Or can it be an autoinflammatory condition? So these are the main uh, conditions that we have to think of. Sorry. Okay, my, sorry. My patient was a 35 year old lady with a normal build. She's a vice principal of a popular boys school in Kurunagara. She was unmarried and her wedding was just a month away when she was admitted to the hospital. I wanted to, uh, we face a lot of difficulties when we manage challenging patients. You know when she's a vice principal of a popular boys school, how many calls you can get with the eminent old boys who are consultants actually, which is actually challenging. Right. Amidst uh, all these things, she was admitted on April 3rd, around uh, April 16th, 2022. So not only the patient itself was challenging, there were a lot of other challenges we had to face. There was this argale going on, uh, labs were not working, uh, we couldn't find uh, staff sometimes, so we were, we had several challenges. So we had several challenges in managing this patient. Right. So when we go to the history, she started feeling unwell on 3rd of April with a sore throat. Swallowing was difficult and her voice was changed. She had high-grade fever. She was treated by her GP with amoxicillin for possible bacterial sore throat with amoxicillin. On the third day of and she didn't feel well actually, even with the commencement of antibiotics. On the third day of antibiotics, after five doses, she noticed a rash in her body on trunk and limbs, which was mildly pruritic at the beginning, and the rash was palpable. And she had nausea and was feeling dizzy as well. She did not feel any improvement with the treatment. Therefore, she came to the hospital and she was admitted to medical wards and her blood pressure was slightly low on admission. And uh, in the medical uh, ward, she was treated for possible delayed hypersensitivity to amoxicillin because she had mildly pruritic crash and she was feeling unwell. Blood pressure was slightly low and with nausea. Uh, but they have considered associated Epstein-Barr virus infection. There you can get rash after uh, treatment of amoxicillin. Somehow the rash faded away after their treatment, continued to have high grade fever and she was feeling unwell. At that time, she did not have any abnormality in systemic examination. This is the fever pattern she had. Uh, then 
uh, she was tested for COVID-19. Uh, rapid antigen test became positive and PCR became positive. So she was transferred to the chest ward from the medical ward and she was managed there for acute COVID infection. But still, after about a week, she did not feel any improvement, no improvement of her fever. And she continued to have constitutional symptoms. She lost almost two kilograms of weight over the last two to three weeks. And she started to develop arthralgia. Actually, she had ankle swelling as well and myalgia with fever. She again developed a macular rash in her trunk. There were small papules as well. And she continued to have her sore throat throughout the illness. And on examination, her throat was erythematous and her right ankle was swollen. At this time, they have thought of possibility of autoimmune connective tissue disease and referred to rheumatology team. However, they have done investigations to rule out infection because her white cell count was 18 with neutrophil leukocytosis, platelet was elevated, and hemoglobin was low. On admission, it was 11.3. Within this one to two weeks, it has dropped to 7.3. Her ESR was 100, which was around 20 on admission. CRP also was high, 256. Her serum creatinine was normal. Her liver functions were abnormal. And alkaline, including alkaline phosphatase, gamma JT, and LDH, bilirubin was slightly deranged. Uh, and uh, CPK was normal. Her urine full report was normal apart from mild uh, protein, which can be present with high grade fever. No growth was there in urine culture, blood culture, stool culture, all possible cultures were done at that time. And ultrasound abdomen showed only mild hepatosplenomegaly, no abdominal nodes. She had no free fluid. Her chest X-ray was normal. And this is about one week after diagnosing and treating for COVID. Dengue negative, typhus antibodies negative, SAT negative, mycoplasma antibodies, IgG, IgM negative, monospot test negative, toxoplasma negative, EBV, IgG positive, IgM negative, Rickard CL antibodies negative, meliodosis antibodies negative. 2D echo was done twice, done two weeks apart. They were normal. There were no vegetations, no features of infective endocarditis. MAN2 test was negative, but procalcitonin was at uh, one point was suggestive of an infection. ANA teeter, just one over 80. This is the end point, nuclear pattern and mixed. ENA profile was normal. Uh, rheumatoid factor also was done, it was normal. Hepatitis B, C, and HIV screening, normal. So at that point, there, though there was neutrophil leukocytosis, elevated CRP, elevated uh, ESR, we could not find any possible infection, but still since procalcitonin was high, we, the uh, microbiologist thought that we should start her on uh, broad spectrum antibiotics and she was on broad spectrum antibiotics. Combs test negative, Blood picture showed normochromic normocytic cells and hypochromic and microcytic cells. Appearance is compatible with iron deficiency and chronic infection, but we usually get the blood picture. Right, so she continued to have fever, same way. It's not typical, uh, yeah, it's continued to have high grade fever above 39. She was on all these uh, antibiotics throughout her disease course. So she was, her fever was not responding to antibiotics, though procalcitonin became 0.78 later. She did not have any features of autoimmune connective tissue disease. And she was losing weight. She was becoming uh, frail in front of you. So what are we missing there? Is this a case of systemic vasculitis? Like um, 
polyarthritis nodosa, they can just come with constitutional symptoms and fever. Can it be auto-inflammatory condition? So these were the things which went through our mind. So then we did serum ferritin, which was very high, 15,800, and capanol was negative, and triglycerides were elevated. I think you must be thinking of possible adult onset Stills disease with high level of uh, serum ferritin with incipient mass actually, macrophage activation syndrome is possible with this much of elevation of ferritin and elevation of triglycerides. And CT contrast enhanced chest abdomen pain which showed only mild hepatosplenomegaly. Bone marrow biopsy was done actually because there was, we were concerned of possibility of macrophage activation syndrome. We don't have the typical uh, treatment modalities, which is anakindra, which can be given even if there is background infection. So we have to st start her on um, IV methylprednisolone. So we had to go for bone marrow biopsy to see whether there's evidence of mass. Mal there was no evidence of mass, malignancy, reactive marrow. There was reactive marrow with sus suppressed erythropoiesis. And interestingly, bone marrow was uh, bone marrow culture was positive for pseudomonas species. So she was possibly immunosuppressed with all these uh, constitutional symptoms, loss of weight and high uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. And first throat culture, when she had sore throat, it became negative, but later, two weeks after, it uh, grew, uh, grew uh, candida species. And she actually had uh, oral and esophageal candidiasis. Sputum culture, gram-negative enteric organism, which microbiologists thought it could be a uh, contamination. So we are dealing with a lady with high-grade fever, persistent sore throat, which is possibly non-supurative because culture did not show anything. And she had elevated inflammatory markers with neutrophil lymphocytosis not responding to both spectrum antibiotics, high serum ferritin, transaminases, and elevated serum triglycerides. Right. This is the famous Yamaguchi criteria for Stills disease. You can see our lady had major criteria, minor criteria, which is sufficient to come to the diagnosis of uh, Stills disease. Fever more than 39 lasting one week or longer, arthralgia or arthritis, lasting two weeks or longer, typical rash. The second rash she had in her trunk, which became prominent only with fever, high-grade fever. And leukocytosis, polymorphic with predominant polymorphic nuclear cells and sore throat, recent development toxic. Uh, she did not have lymphadenopathy, but there was hepatomegaly and splenomegaly, abnormal liver function test, and she had almost negative antinuclear antibody test and rheumatoid factor, and almost all the infections were excluded. Yeah. So I'm going to talk to you on adult onset stills disease. Though it is called adult onset stills disease, we think now it is just the disease continuum of uh, systemic onset JIA, but typically still we use if it is before onset of is before the 16th birthday, is it, it is systemic onset JIA, but if it is after, we call it adult onset stills disease, but now it is believed that it is just the same disease, just the same disease continuum. When we compare uh, a, the, the other types of uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, actually we don't take the master uh, uh, continuous disease into adulthood, but Still, this disease, we think it's the same disease, same phenotype uh, continue uh, to the adulthood. Right, it is an autoinflammatory condition due to innate immune cell activation. In autoimmune connective tissues, tissue diseases, you know uh, the damage is done by the autoantibodies or autoantigen specific T and B cells. That's the activation of adaptive immune system in the autoimmune conditions like SLE, the, the autoimmune diseases we know of. But in 
adults uh, instills disease, it is auto-inflammatory, activation of the innate immune system. Amplica amplification of the inflammatory response, that is cytokine storm. This, this word became very famous after COVID infection, is multifactorial. We think it could, can uh, trigger by an infection. So it is very common you get the first manifestation of Stills disease after a certain infection. There are several case reports of first presentation of Stills disease after COVID infection. Here in this patient, possibly she had this thing. Initially, she actually had uh, uh, back, uh, COVID infection, but she later developed uh, Stills disease secondary to the activation of her cytokines. Right. This is just a diagram of innate, immu innate immune system and adaptive immune system. You can see in this side, it is the autoimmune diseases. In this side, is there you have autoinflammatory condition. In the mid mid middle, you have mixed pattern. Ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, you do see combination of autoinflammation and autoimmunity. This side, you have monogenic autoimmune conditions. So this is a very, not a very common disease. It's very uncommon. One to three per 100,000. Yeah. There's bimodal age distribution between 15 to 20. There's one uh, uh, peak between 15 to 25 years, the second peak been between 36 to 46 years. These are the clinical features. Most of them, 75 to 95 percent of them, will have fever, rash, the typical rash with arthritis and arthralgia. In addition to that, they can have myalgia, pharyngitis, lymphadenopathy, and splenomegaly. Splenomegaly is more common than hepatomegaly. In minority of patients, you will get hepatomegaly, pleurisy, serositis, pericarditis, and abdominal pain. Actually, if there's pleurisy, pericarditis, and abdominal pain, you have to be very careful because they can go into macrophage activation syndrome very soon. And then in addition to these clinical features, they will have, uh, feature, they can have uh, features of macrophage activation syndrome, which I'm going to discuss later in my presentation. Macrophage activation syndrome is associated with many rheumatological diseases, but most commonly with Stills disease. It is very infrequent, yet very serious, and potentially a fatal complication. Right, so this is in, Stills disease, fever. Uh, fever is usually a quotidian fever, a daily recurring fever. It can You can have two fever spikes per day, often precedes other manifestations. So you will get the fever first before the other clinical features. And rash, you everybody know about the rash. It's a evanescent, salmon-colored, macular or papular rash. You can have papular rash as well. Um, usually non-pruritic, predominantly in the trunk and extremities, but your palms and soles also can be involved. Occasionally, the face can be involved and you can see the cobna film of the uh, bed sheet, uh, pink creases of the bed sheet in your back of the uh, chest. Arthralgia and arthritis, initially mild, transient and oligoarticular, but they can, uh, be very destructive and deforming uh, as the disease go on. So there can be polyarthritis, and interestingly, distal interphalangeal joint can get affected. You know, uh, in many rheumatological diseases, apart from psoriasis, usually rheumatoid arthritis, you don't get distal interphalangeal. Here, you can get distal interphalangeal joint involvement and sacroiliac joint involvement in Stills disease. As I said before, usually pharyngitis is very severe, so you get swallowing difficulty. It is usually non suppurative You will not see the pustules you usually see in typical tonsillitis, bacterial tonsillitis. Occasionally precedes fever. Sometimes you will first get the sore throat. And the MRI scan suggests cricothyroid perichondritis as the cause for this 
non-subutative pharyngitis. There will be liver disease as well, elevation of serum hepatic aminotransferases and alkaline phosphatase, LDH, hepatomegaly in minority. Uh, you can have serositis, pleurisy, pleural effusion. Sometimes you can get transient pulmonary infiltrates, but usually respiratory distress is very uncommon. But if there is respiratory distress, you have to think of associated macrophage activation syndrome, which can be fatal. Uh, lymph node enlargement and spleen. Uh, splenomegaly will be there in two thirds of patients. Usually lymph node enlargement in, uh, is typically symmetrical. Gastrointestinal system, abdominal pain will be there in up to half of patients. There will be nausea, anorexia, and weight loss like in our patient. Abdominal symptoms may be related to lymphadenitis, aseptic peritonitis, or acute peritonitis, pancreatitis. Right, few words about macrophage activation syndrome. It is a subtype of hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis that occurs in the setting of systemic rheumatic disease, most commonly associated with Steele's disease and systemic onset JIA, driven by hyperinflammatory state or cytokine storm. All your cytokines in the body get activated simultaneously, leading to multi organ failure, leading to death, actually. So it is characterized by persistent high fever. And I told you in Stills disease, usually splenomegaly will be there commonly. But if you have both organs enlarged, you have to think of incipient mass. And there will be multiple lab laboratory abnormalities. There will be cytopenia. You know that in Stills disease, usually you will get neutropic leukocytosis. But if the patients start developing cytopenia, it could be you, 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 the patient must be getting uh, macrophage activation syndrome. And ferritin is elevated in uh, Steele's disease, but in if there is mass, it will be very high, above 10,000. And uh, CRP will be elevated, but there will be parox paradoxical drop in ESR due to low pyrotonogen levels in uh, uh, mass. So you, Sometimes if, if you monitor only the ESR, you might think that patient is improving with your treatment because ESR is dropping, but it could be otherwise. And then if the patient is having transaminitis and evidence of serositis, be prepared, the patient can go into mass. It is the leading cause of death for patients with Stills disease. As I said, it is serious, but rare. Uh, there are no uh, enough data to look at the prevalence, but it is said in large study done in Japan, they said that it's around 1.7% uh, the prevalence. Can occur at any time during Steele's disease. So it's not only during the initial acute phase, even in the Establish disease at any point you can get mass. That is something you must remember. So patient, when patient present to you with in the clinic with cytopenia and low ESR, you might think if patient was on methotrexate or disease modifying agent, you might think that patient is getting side effects to the medication, and it might not be. Therefore, you have to uh, dig into the history. And mass and Steele's disease can be can present simultaneously as well. Yes, then um, if there is features of macrophage activation syndrome, it could be due to the disease itself or it could be due to an infection because infection can trigger the occurrence of macrophage activation syndrome in a patient with Stills disease. It's critical to distinguish when a flare of Stills disease is evolving into mass since mass can progress rapidly, as I said before. So when your patient comes to you to the clinic, have a high degree of suspicion always. Differentiating Stills disease with mass from Stills disease alone can be challenging 
as I said, because patients are sometimes on, if it is an established disease, patients are on sometimes methotrexate if it is articular symptoms predominant disease. But mass is usually less common in articular disease, the articular disease. It's more common with systemic disease, yet you can have macrophage activation syndrome. You can attribute all the features to methotrexate, elevated transaminitis, elevated uh, liver enzymes, low white cell count, everything. Therefore, have high degree of suspicion if you are handling a patient with steer disease. Clinical features helpful to distinguish patients with stills and concurrent mass. As I said before, uh, when patient is having significant weight loss, hepatomegaly, uh, abnormal liver functions, neurological symptoms, they can have concurrent mass. Serum ferritin levels are typically very high with Stills disease with, con sorry about this 3,500. In Stills disease, usually it's about 3,500, but when there's associated macrophage activation sy syndrome, usually it will be above 10,000. Transaminitis is more pronounced when there's associated macrophage activation syndrome with stills. And elevated serum triglyceride is there when there is macrophage activation syndrome. Usually it is not seen in uh, stills disease when it is they are alone without macrophage activation. In macrophage activation, when there's macrophage activation, there will be high rates of cytopenia, including leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, or pancytopenia. Maybe normal in early in the course of mass, but cytopenia can evolve as the disease progresses. ESR in patients with both stills and mass may be lower than expected for the degree of inflammation. When stills is associated with mass, ESR will be paradoxically low or even normal due to low or normal levels of haptoglobin and fibrinogen. The presence of bone marrow examination of numerous well-differentiated macrophages that are engaged actively in the phagocytosis of hemopertic elements is diagnostic hallmark of mass. But when this thing is there, it doesn't mean that patient is, the mass is always due to stills. Even mass is due to another disease, due to an infection. Still, you can have the similar bone marrow picture. Right. So these are the laboratory tests, abnormalities you see in Stills disease. Elevated ESI is there almost always. White cell count is more than 10,000 in 92%, more than 15,000 in 81%. Neutrophils will be more than 80%. And you know serum albumin is a negative inflammatory marker. When you have high degree of inflammation, your albumin will go down even if you eat normally. So it doesn't really represent malnutrition. It's, it represents the uh, uh, amount of inflammation in your body. And there will be elevated liver enzymes, any liver enzyme. It's not only the transaminitis, anything. Anemia will be there. Platelet will be elevated, and there will be negative ANA and negative rheumatoid factor. So again, the same thing, ESI and CRP market elevations in virtually all patients with Stills disease, paradoxical drop in ESI. When liver function tests and CRP are stable, so all the other things are stable, in, that means they are still high, but there will be paradoxical drop in ESR when there is incipient mass. Uh, serum ferritin, increased ferritin synthesis as a part of the acute phase response to inflammatory cytokines. And uh, degree of ferritin elevation correlates with Stills disease activity and has been suggested that it's a serologic marker to monitor the response to treatment. It is suggested, still we do not practice, but it, it can be a marker to monitor the response. High serum ferritin levels are not sufficient to diagnose Stills disease. That we must remember because it can be seen in other diseases associated with 
other syndromes such as mass unrelated to serous disease. You can have elevated serum ferritin in catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which we cannot miss actually, we can diagnose it clinically. And you can have it in septic shock also. Right. This is the natural history of the disease course. There are three main patterns. Uh, monophasic pattern, intermittent pattern, and chronic pattern. Approximately one third of patients fall into each category. Monophasic pattern, you will just have a disease course last only weeks to months, and then the disease will completely resolve. Uh, usually systemic features predominate in this group. If you have articular system, it's most likely going to be a chronic, uh, it's going to be persistent disease. If you have only systemic features, most of the time it is going to be a monophasic disease. Intermittent pattern, one or more disease flares with or without articular symptoms. There you can have articular symptoms with complete remission between episodes lasting from weeks up to one or two years. Although subsequent flares are not predictable, they tend to be less severe and of shorter duration than the initial disease episode. Chronic pattern. Usually you will have persistently active disease. Usually in this type, articular symptoms predominate. A destructive arthritis may occur in patients in this group. Then I'll move on to the treatment of adult onset still disease. I will not discuss this in detail. Goals of therapy. Control the physical signs and symptoms along with the reduction of inflammatory markers and prompt recognition and treatment of hyperinflammatory complication, that is mass. Prevention of end organ damage, including joint injury and other major organ complications. Minimization of the risk of adverse effects of therapy, including long-term effects of loop corticoid. This is very important in managing patients with Stills disease, uh, most of the time associated with mass, because it's very difficult to distinguish this from infections. Most of the time, these patients are having associated other concomitant infections like in my patient. So it's very difficult to initiate treatments, most of the time methylprednisolone pulses. So therefore you have to have pre-treatment evaluation properly. You have to confirm the diagnosis, exclude mimics such as infections and malignancy before initiating immunosuppressive therapies, Do it is very difficult. When uncertain, so if even if it's still, it could be an infection, still you have to treat because otherwise patient can die. So the best treatment option would be anakin, right? Leukin 1 antagonist, unfortunately, which is not available for us. So we have to go for glucocorticoids if there is associated, uh, suspected or incipient mass. Pre-treatment testing is needed. Same as with other biologics, we have to do just general testing for all patients, full blood count, creatinine, liver functions, ESR, CRP, and lipids should be monitored, monitored when they are going, if they are going to be started on uh, uh, JAK inhibitors or IL-6, and ferritin and D-dimer should be done. And you have to do hepatitis viral screening, testing for latent tuberculosis. But as I said before, if you're suspecting a patient still with cytokine storm, you're not going to wait until one to Israel. You're going to start them with Tanakendra if it is available. And sometimes in our setup, we have to take the risk and uh, treat, start them on methylprednisolone. It's really challenging. So treatment, usually it differs according to you're going to treat a patient in one set disease or if it is going to be an established disease. So the initial therapy, usually based upon if there is, whether there is associated cytokine storm or not, and the severity of the disease. And also, it is influenced by whether systemic features are predominant or articular features are predominant. 
During periods of active systemic disease, patients are at high risk of developing macrophage activation syndrome. Arthritis may be evident early in the disease or appear subsequently and often persists after systemic symptoms have resolved. So it can sometimes start early and last longer. So is mass present. The management of Stills disease in patients with high degree drug suspicion of concomitant or incipient mass frequently involves the use of combination therapy with biologics such as anakindra together with glucocorticoids. So this is the treatment if there is uh, associated mass or incipient mass. So you have to pulse them with steroids and it should be given with um, interleukin-1 inhibitor. Unfortunately, which we don't have. So I think we usually go for year six inhibitor. Is this is mild to moderate? Then if mass is present, this is how we treat. Then we have to look at the disease severity in the initial, if uh, this is a new onset disease. For patients without evidence of active or incipient mass, a distinction should be made between patients with mild or mild to moderate disease and patients with moderate to severe disease. So mild to moderate disease, but we have to look at the severity of the disease to decide on the management uh, treatment. Mild to moderate disease. Mild to moderate disease is uh, characterized by non-disabling fever, rash, arthralgia or mild arthritis, and the absence of mass. Initial management is usually with NSID alone. Actually, our patient first responded to naproxen. Uh, though she had other features. Uh, initial management is with NSAID alone rather than glucocorticoids, demands or biologics. Especially at this point, we will be still evaluating for alternative causes when there is mild to moderate disease. Most patients in whom NSAID alone is inadequate to control symptoms, then you have to switch to glucocorticoid. You are not usually going to add, but you are going to switch to glucocorticoids to reduce the gastric side effects. If long-term steroids should be given, then you have to rapidly advance to the biologic treatment, even in, in mild to moderate disease, uh, because we have to we have to discontinue glucocorticoids within two months. For patients primarily with arthritis rather than systemic symptoms, methotrexate is the uh, usually treatment of choice to spare steroids. Then in moderate to severe disease, so in mild to moderate disease, you go stepwise. You start in SIDs, and if it is not going to respond, then go to steroids. Then you start something if you need long-term steroid. In moderate to severe disease, it is defined by the additional presence of clinically significant serositis, pleurisioperitonitis, moderate to severe and debilitating polyarthritis, persistent high fevers despite treatment with NSAIDs or internal organ involvement. So there you have to initiate therapy with ideally with IL-1. Glucocorticoids are a reasonable alternative which is the treatment we have. So if there is associated, I think I discussed this, usually we have to combine an agenda with glucocorticoid. Right. In subsequent therapy, established disease, the management will de depend on whether initial treatment is successful or not. Uh, so specific drug choices for subsequent management after initial treatment of new disease depend upon the effectiveness and risk of first-time therapies and the range and severity of disease manifestations. If there's good response to initial therapy, then your aim is to stop steroids as soon as possible. As I said before, if it is more articular uh, predominant disease, you start them on MTX. If it is more systemic predominant, you have to start them on biologics. Moderate to severe disease requiring chronic glucocorticoid therapy. If you cannot again stop um, prednisolone, you start them on synthetic demand or biologic demand, or sometimes both. Right, uh, that's all. So uh, the take home message is actually never ever delay the 
treatment of adult onset stairs disease because the mass is on your, I mean, it could be incipient. So sometimes you have to take challenges, uh, especially when we have, we are in a very resource poor setting and we have to get together and get an Akindra, like Dr. Jayatri said, at least using uh, special circumstances. Right. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. There, there, yes, ma there were many case reports in literature. Uh, they have, uh, there were so many patients who first had their first manifestations of Steele's disease after COVID infection and COVID vaccination. There were several case reports. Yeah, another, another Yes, Look at that. Yeah. So yes. Improvement. such a manner, he even went to his eyes. 
Hence, last days I didn't go to see him. That's because I didn't have experience, not because my father's situation or skills did not exist, exist in the adult or pediatric world when I was working in other stations. So, general people who are, you know, the registrar's VPs, who are going to be VPs, are here. So, that is something we need to, that scares me. So, how many people out there die without being recognized in a setting of PEO? So, that is the other thing. Uh, please, we have to discuss more, share experience. Okay, thank you. That was a great case. Thank you. It is said that if patient is in remission, in remission sir, to continue disease modifying agent for another two to three months, not for a long period, like in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and then gradually take off and stop. That's what they suggest. We have one experience. Uh, still, disease was there three years before, and then gradually came off the disease by illness and surgeon. And after COVID, she developed again similar features. But that time, even also possibly one in NK, but almost all the features were like skills. So we management skills, but in the criteria, in the what is that chemistry? Should be negative. Thank you, Dr. for the very wonderful lectures. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting and informative presentation and the, the discussion. So next presentation uh, will be on rebuilding the language bridge the stroke survivors journey to be delivered by Dr. Bindi Atukorala, Senior Registrar in uh, Rehabilitation Medicine, RRH Ragam. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. Sorry, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Palpisa Nayaka, Consultant in Rheumatology and Rehabilitation, President of CSRRSL, for giving me the opportunity. I am Dr. Vidya Atukorada, SR. Rehabilitation medicine. My topic is rebuilding the language bridge stroke survivors journey. My patient is Mr. A, 35 years old businessman on antihypertensives for last four years, developed sudden onset weakness of right upper limb and lower limb and global FSA, FSA on 15th of September 2023, that is four and a half months ago, presented around three hours of symptom onset. Patient has a family history of hypertension and a history of cigarette smoking 30 pack years behind him. Cardiovascular system examination revealed pulse rate of 90 per minute, blood pressure was 150, 90 millimeter mercury. CNS examination revealed GCS of 8, eye response was 3, verb, eye opening was 3, verbal 1, motor 4. There was right upper motor neuron facial palsy. There were no obvious other cranial nerve defects. Right sided hypotonia, right upper limb and lower limb dense weakness. He is a right handed person. He had right sided diminished tender reflexes and bilateral equivocal plantar reflexes. NCCD brain showed ischemic stroke with hemorrhagic transformation that is done after 4 hours. Usually hemorrhagic transformations occur uh, 6 hours after ischemic stroke, but uh, this was at 4 hours. That is in the uh, left uh, MCA area. He was managed as ischemic stroke with hemorrhagic transformation, later underwent rehabilitation with physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy. Today, my topic is mainly about speech and language therapy. Evaluation of speech and language defects in a stroke patient. 
This is usually done by speech and language therapist. First thing is allowing assessment, then cognitive assessment, then assessment of oral motor skills, then get an idea about speech and language defect, whether it is aphasia, dysarthria, apraxia, dysphonia, or a combination. Then aphasia screening to determine the type of aphasia. First, allowing assessment. Uh, don't start oral feeds when the patient's ECS is less than 13, or when there are cranial nerve palsies, or when the patient is unable to keep in a seated position because there's risk of aspiration. Go for a proper salivary assessment with the help of speech and language therapist within 24 hours. Sometimes some centers use three ounce water saliva test, but that is risky. Global incidence of aspiration pneumonia in stroke patients is 14%. There are no statistics for Sri Lankan patients. Salivary assessment of Mr. A, my patient, Assess 24 hours uh, after the stroke, after admission, uh, impaired salivary was there, so ND tube was inserted. Cognitive assessment. Cognitive linguistic skills are very important for optimal use of speech and language. Necessary for starting a tailor-made speech and language therapy program for the patient. Ideally should be assessed using a standardized cognitive test such as MOCA. But in acute stroke, it is difficult to use such a test because patients are confused. So preserve situational understanding of the patient can be taken as a bare minimum adequate cognition. Cognitive assessment of Mr. A, assessed on third day, he had preserved situational understanding. Assessment of oral motor skills. Oral motor skills refer to the movement of muscles of the face, example lips and jaw, and oral area. Example, tongue and soft palate, especially the movements related to speech and salary. Assessment of oral motor skills of mistake, assessed on third day, that was also impaired. Speech and language deficiency is faced by a stroke patient. Aphasia. Aphasia is abnormalities of language function not due to visual, auditory, or motor defects. Dysphasia. Partial loss of language functions now no longer uses. We don't use this term now. Apraxia of speech, disorder of motor planning involving involving speech production. Then dysphonia, abnormal sound production, dysarthria, disorder of articulation. Aphasia. Aphasia definitions. General definition. Aphasia is a language disorder caused by damage to parts of the brain that control speech and understanding the language. Depending on the areas involved, a person might have different levels of ability to speak and understand others. It is not the result of a sensory or motor deficit, a general intellectual deficit, confusion or a psychiatric disorder. Dali, Asen and Brown in 1975 defined aphasia as a multimodality reduction in the capacity to decode and encode meaningful linguistic elements. Broad classification of aphasia can classify into Three categories, non-fluent aphasia, fluent aphasia, and verbal aphasia. Non-fluent aphasia, broadcast aphasia, transcortical motor aphasia, mixed transcortical motor aphasia, fluent aphasia, sa vernicus aphasia, transcortical sensory aphasia, conduction aphasia, anomic aphasia, and global. Third one is global aphasia. Reason for broad classification. With initial few questions, we can differentiate whether patient is non-fluent or fluent. Uh, that require for further rehabilitation. Fluency. Uh, it is a multi-dimensional term. Involved components are effort, rate of speech, grammatical accuracy, rhythm, and articulated precision. A patient can be fluent on one dimension and non-fluent on another. another. For example, patient have a low rate of speech, but there may be grammatical accuracy. So that is also non-fluent aphasia. But we usually consider rate of speech as fluency, but it is not accurate. A more detailed classification of aphasia. This more detailed classification uh, depends on fluency, comprehension, and whether the patient is able to repeat or not. Aphasia screening. Aphasia screening test. Used to identify the type of aphasia, whether it is broadcast, burning case, global, or like that. Used to serially assess progression of the therapy. 
depending on the type of aphasia speech and language therapies formulate individualized set of therapies for the patient most screening tests are very lengthy example western aphasia battery there are some short screening tests for english language like mississippi aphasia screening test sensitivity and specificity is 74% and 94% uh, those things are operator dependent there is no validated aphasia screening test for single language currently using in sri lanka there are several test but those are not validated we have used translated and modified version of mississippi aphasia screening test basic components of a short aphasia screening test comprehension repetition confrontational naming automatic speech reading and writing I have made recordings after getting consent from the patient's next of kin. FSA screening of the patient performed on fifth day. Comprehension is comprehensive simple command is adequate. Then complex comprehension. that is impaired this repetition is adequate automatic speech is uh, adequate Confrontational naming was affected. Reading also affected. Writing, he was unable to assess. We we were unable to assess as his dominant hand was affected. FSC screening of Mr. A. Comprehension near normal, repetition normal, automatic speech normal, confrontational naming impaired, word finding impaired. Answering a simple question like what is your name impaired? So, Mr. A had non tone aphasia, most likely transcortical motor aphasia. Difference between transcortical motor aphasia and Bocas aphasia is both things are non tone aphasias. In Bocas aphasia, patient can't repeat. This patient can repeat. So, this is most likely transcortical motor aphasia. ICF model. This is impression classification of function and disability and uh, I have applied the model to the patient. ICF model for his speech and language deficits, health condition ischemic infarction and hemorrhagic transformation, affected body structure is brain, affected body functions is voice functions, fluency and rhythm of speech, activities and participation restrictions, receiving written messages, speaking, producing nonverbal messages, writing, conversation and contextual factors are premobic personality. All the uh, components have specific form. Speech line language therapy started on fifth day by speech and language therapist.
Để sẽ dần After my sessions of therapy on 15th day, his confrontation and aiming improved approximately 10 to 50 percent. Word finding difficulty improved approximately 40 percent. This video is confrontation and aiming was uh, adequate. Confrontation and aiming defects. Blocking, that is unable to name the object. Circumlocution, described rather than naming the object. Substitution of various types. For example, patient is telling spoon for four and paraphrasing. Mr. A has blocking. He has blocking. Importance of speech and language recovery after stroke. According to Sri Lankan stroke registry, stroke prevalence is 10.4 per 1000 adults. Schemic stroke accounts for 70%. Hemorrhagic stroke 21%. TIA 8%. Venous strokes 2%. Post-stroke APCS 50%. More common is ischemic strokes. According to global statistics, stroke prevalence is 11%. Post-stroke APCS 38%. That 30 is slightly uh, lower than Sri Lankan statistics. Importance of speech and language recovery after stroke. FAC after stroke is a major disability. FAC are negatively impacts rehabilitation. FAC has a high risk of depression. So it is essential to give optimal care for post-stroke FAC. Speech and language recovery trajectory. This is a generalized, spontaneous, speech and language uh, recovery trajectory. You can see from day 2 to day 14, there's a rapid recovery. After that, it is almost flat. Postulated mechanisms of speech and language recovery after stroke. Post-stroke day 2, reperfusion of the ischemic penumbra is the mechanism responsible for active resolution of FA6 symptoms around second day. Then, post-stroke day 2 to day 14, Neuroplasticity plays a key role in language recovery. Recruitment of perilational left hemisphere regions for language related activities is important. Then, components of neuroplasticity are external sprouting, neurogenesis, angiogenesis, and ultimately formation of new neural pathways. After post stroke day 14, very slow recovery, that is also neuroplasticity, and unmasking of language processing ability in the right hemisphere is important. Earlier, left hemisphere was important. After day 14, right hemisphere. In mistake, global FAC was converted into non fluent FAC between 2nd and 14 days. In most stroke survivors, recovery is different across domains. That is, naming those things, uh, confrontational naming, repetition, those things are different. Improvement usually occurs in word finding, grammatical construction, repetition, and reading if, if affected. But less consistent improvement occurs if comprehension is affected and it takes longer time comprehension. <coughs> Prediction of speech and language recovery after stroke. Prediction of level of language recovery in an individual stroke patient is difficult. Some develop spontaneous recovery while others may need interventions. Some generalized predictors of good recovery are there. One is less severe initial FAC as a good recovery. That is due to small area and non-dominant hemispheric damage. That is right side mainly. Then ischemic stroke has uh, good recovery rather than uh, hemorrhagic stroke. Reasonable post-stroke cognitive level. 
young age with less comorbidities. Mr. A, predictive factors affecting speech and language recovery was positive factors of ischemic stroke, reasonable cause of cognitive level, younger age. Negative factors were severe initial aphasia, large area of brain damage involving dominant hemisphere and comorbidity. Uh, if a if patient develops worsening aphasia after initial recovery, that is after months, MRI scan of brain can be done after six months. Then there will be white matter hyperintensities uh, hyper on T2 weighted uh, images that indicate loss of long range white matter fibers. Other thing is post stroke day 5, we can do functional MRI. If functional MRI shows perilational activity, that perilational activity positively correlates with uh, language recovery. Future methods which can be used to predict recovery of FAC after stroke on individual basis, database approach method and model led approach method. Database approach method. Predictions can be made from data obtained from previous patients who had similar brain damage. This approach will allow the clinician to predict language recovery after stroke. Then model led approach. Necessary to build a neural network model for language. We are still far away from a personalized approach that considers the individual network pathology. Our knowledge is uh, lacking in that sense. Management strategies of post-stroke aphasia. Broadly, non-pharmacological and pharmacological methods. Non-pharmacological methods are speech and language therapy, uh, an improvement of cognitive skills, neurologic music therapy, speech and language therapy. Speech and language therapy was first described by Paul Broca in his seminal 1865 paper. It remains the standard of care for patients with APC up to now. It is categorized under behavioral therapy modality because language is a set of verbal behaviors learning through reinforcement. Principal methods of speech and language therapy. There are two methods, impairment-based method and functional communication method. Impairment-based method focuses directly on decreasing the language impairment through structural therapy that targets subcomponents of the language, example, phonology, morphology, and syntax. Functional communication approach focuses directly on communication abilities rather than subcomponents of the language. We mainly use this method for mistake. Functional communication approach eliminates communication barriers in the environment. Caregiver can be tra trained in this method. Recommendation is used to combine method uh, more favoring functional communication approach. And more severe non fluent APAC are responded to impairment based approach, while milder cases show significant better response to functional communication approach. When to start speech and language therapy in post stroke aphasia? Early aphasia is less than four weeks, late aphasia is more than four weeks. Early aphasia, recovery more than less than four weeks, is highly variable and probably influenced by several different factors that may be difficult to control in rehabilitation studies. So it is difficult to prove contribution played by speech and language therapy using trials. There's a one trial, very early rehabilitation of for speech versus trial yielded a non-significant result. That means early aphasia, uh, there is less evidence for speech and language therapy. Late aphasia, there is ample evidence that speech and language therapy will improve. Predicting outcome of language rehabilitation is aphasia polar trial yielded significant result. But recommendation is start speech and language therapy uh, within 48 hours. How to deliver speech and language therapy? Single session duration is 30 to 60 minutes. Frequency is two days per week. Duration is 16 sessions, that is eight weeks. There are a limited number of speech and language therapies. So tele-rehabilitation and app-based speech and language therapy can overcome this issue. Other techniques using is speech and language therapy. One is constraint induced language therapy. Model based on the force use of verbal oral language as a sole channel of communication. While any alternative communication modes such as writing, gesturing, or pointing are prevented. Second one is live participation approach to aphasia, that is, reintegration of the patient with aphasia into the community. Other important thing is teaching family members some tips when communicating with the patient. Get attention of the patient, make sure there are no distractions, radio, television, get the eye contact, keep the voice at a normal level, speak slowly, use simple words. 
to small sentences and repeat keywords. Ask yes no questions. Give the patient plenty of time to speak. In shootable instances, use alternative methods and gestures, facial expressions, written words, drawings. Other one is uh, improvement of cognitive skills. It is an integral part of speech and language rehabilitation. For effective development of cognitive skills, there are many apps. Then neurologic music therapy. There are two methods, therapeutic singing and melodic intonation. Melodic intonation. Usually language centers are located in dominant hemisphere. Corresponding area of non-dominant hemisphere is responsible for medical ele musical elements of language. Like rhythm and pitch, that is called intonation. The non-dominant hemisphere is better suited for processing slowly modulated signals, while the dominant hemisphere is better suited for rapidly modulated signals. Musical elements can be applied to ordinary day-to-day -day speech. By repeated therapy, non-dominant hemisphere can be used to produce speech. Most non-fluent aphasic patients can sing even if they can't, cannot speak. Most of the non-fluent aphasic patients, even uh, very severe ones, can sing even if they cannot speak. So use mainly by, for severe non-fluent aphasic patients with good comprehension. There should be good comprehension. Unfortunately, I was not able to uh, make a uh, melodic inten in intonation session using a local patient, but I have downloaded one from internet. Non-invasive non brain stimulation techniques. Uh, there are two techniques. One is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, supply low frequency, one to four, four hertz. Magnetic pulses to the cortex through scalp by means of a by means of a head gear. Patient can feel a tapping sound in the head. This is a transcranial magnetic stimulation method. Uh, there are two uh, high power electromagnets uh, in the range of one Tesla. That is uh, sometimes you see uh, the uh, power of. Uh, MRI machines, okay. Magnets using MRI machines. This is a complex instrument. The other one is transcranial direct current stimulation. Supply cerebral cortex with weak polarizing current that is 30 volts and 2 milliampere via scalp electrodes. This is a simple equipment and it's less costly. Comparison of transcranial direct current stimulation and transcranial magnetic stimulation. Transcranial direct current stimulation, simple equipment, less expensive, while using patient can go, manipulate cortical function in a less focal manner. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, complex equipment, more expensive, while using patients cannot go, manipulate cortical functions in a more focal manner, so this is effective, EM is more effective. Neurobiological mechanism of non-invasive brain stimulation techniques. Neuroplasticity is the key mechanism involved, perilational area of activated by forced depolarization to take over the dead neural tissue functions. Then long-term changes in neural activity and behavior occurred by long-term potentiation and long-term depression seen following repetitive neural, neuronal activation. That is two uh, methods uh, where uh, repetitive neuronal activation uh, favors a good outcome. LTP and LTD. Modulation of neurotransmitter levels and gene expression also occurred during uh, transcranial uh, TMS. How to deliver non-invasive brain stimulation? A session lasts for 30 minutes every day for 15 days. Demonstrated language improvement in number of studies and shown to persist for months after the discontinuation of simulation. Recommendations can be used in subacute or chronic post of aphasia. Use with SLT better modalities TMS. Then pharmacological methods. Uh, acute therapy thrombolysis. Thrombolysis improve post stroke KPSI in large vessel occlusions, not in small vessel occlusions, large vessel occlusions. Then tonic therapy. Current evidence suggests that drugs such as donapacil and memantine can improve prognosis of post stroke KPSI. Donapacil improves comprehension, naming, and repetition. Memantine improves naming and spontaneous speech and repetition. There are systematic uh, reviews. Uh, 
favoring use of donapacil. This is one example of small trial, a trial with donapacil. Randomized double blind placebo control study of donapacil in post hoc aphasia. Number of patients 26 patients, donapacil low 10 mg per day. Outcome improve aphasia related endpoint after 16 weeks of treatment relative to placebo p value is uh, 0 0.037 that is significant. Treatment of post stroke depression that is also very important in stroke uh, rehabilitation, speech and language rehabilitation. Incidence of depression after post stroke aphasia is around 60 percent, 70 percent. Uh, depression hinders speech and language recovery, so most patients need a psychiatric referral. Those are my references, uh, acknowledgements. Thank you.